Well, Jim, you did a fine job up here singing and, and sermonizing. It was very, very good. And another uh, situation of surround sound. And this is good because what Jim was up here preaching on is the foundation of it all. It's all about Christ. It's not about, rela- it's not about religion. It's about relationship, right? And as I've said on so many occasions, a relationship without right knowledge is an illusion. It's not just a thing. You can either have uh, a God of your imagination or the real God. And I'll tell you what, you can't imagine how great this God is. Yeah, it's beyond your imagination. So find about... Find out about the real one. That's the most important thing. And when you do, you won't help yourself. You'll love him because he is so ultimately lovable. And when you, you know, I've also said, you will resemble what you love, right? So right knowledge is really important. Uh, We got a lot of it this morning from Pastor Jim. And now I'm going to follow up with something a little longer and a little deeper, okay? Because, you know, one of the things I'm up here for is not just to feed you, but also to give you a good understanding that you can use when you're confronted with people who tell you that this is nonsense, that there's nothing to it. I want you to be able to say, hey, listen, the only way you can say that is if you don't know about it. And here's how you can find out about it. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. Let the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. It declares, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and was and which is to come, the Almighty. Who said that? It's Jesus said that, right? He says he's the Almighty. He says he's the beginning and the end. He says it's the, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Tav in the Hebrew. It's Jesus. Well, what is a beginning and what is an end? A beginning is a start, which implies that there will be an end or a completion. But it can also be a source, which implies product, a source producing something. God is a start. He is the source. He is the point of origin. And he does provide for everything that he started. All of this points toward an end. And what is an end? It's not just a cessation of activity. It is an outcome. It is normal to think of end as a limit of something that has length or a finish or a conclusion, but it can also be a result, an outcome, something to strive toward the purpose for which something was begun. Do you realize just how connected the beginning is to its end? (laughs) Without a beginning, there can be no end. Without a beginning, there cannot be an outcome, right? But we all know that an end does not always have to resemble its beginning. God gave Lucifer a beginning, didn't he? But God didn't give him his end. He chose that for himself. And you know what? We do that too. When Jim talked about many are called but few are chosen, we're all called. There are no exceptions. We're all called, but we have to do the choosing. It's really, really important for us to stand, understand that. You know, there are those uh, groups who think that God specially chooses some and rejects others. He wants everybody. There are no exceptions. He wants everybody. And he gives us everything we need in order to receive him, and we have a choice. We can either accept him or reject him. We can seek our own way, or we can seek his way. We can eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, 
or we can eat of the tree of life. Who's the tree of life? Who's the tree of life, folks? Jesus. Jesus is the tree of life. And what is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Human opinion. Amen? I think I'll do it my way. My experience tells me this is right, and I'll put my experience above what God says. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's what makes us gods, right? We toss God off the throne and put ourselves on it. That's why the serpent in the garden, Nikash, the serpent, actually is a Hebrew word that means not only a snake, it means learning from your own experience. And the, sa the Satan said, the serpent said, you can learn from your own experience. You can be like God, learning from your own experience. Toss him to the side. You don't need him. And man's been doing it ever since. But 2,000 years ago, that changed. And now we have a choice to make. God gave Lucifer a beginning, but he chose to be Satan. God gave man a beginning. And like Satan, man has to choose what he would like for his end. You know, God doesn't send anybody to hell. Do you know that? Man chooses it. It's a choice. If you don't choose to get on the right bus, don't blame God when you go on the wrong one. So a beginning does not guarantee an end, but it will be the end, but will the end be a success or a failure? That's what I'm really wondering about here. That's the question that we all have to have. In God's economy, it can only be a success if it achieves the objectives that God sets for it. What was the objective that God set for beginning everything, for beginning man? Do anybody, anybody know? Do you all know what God's objective is? The objective is himself. You know, the word of God says that when it's all over and done with, everything will be God all in all, right? God will be all in all, right? Doesn't it say that? The objective is God himself. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 28. Now, well, all things are made subject to him, to God. Then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him that God may be all in all. So God's objective in the very beginning was for the end that be, to be himself, right? That everything be in him. God reveals himself in Jesus he is the first in the first verse of the Bible and in the last verse of the Bible. And I might say, add, he's in everything between the two. All the way through the Bible, you see him. But you know what? You've got to know what he looks like before you'll ever see him then, right? That's one of the things that happens as you get more acquainted with who this wonderful God is. And God presents himself to man as a man. You know, this is Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form, right? That's what the scripture says. You can either accept it or reject it. But the point is that God is unknowable without Jesus. You can't know God unless you know Jesus. Jesus is God made manifest to man. So God reveals himself in Jesus. Jesus is the son of God in the first word of the Bible and he is the creator of all in the third word of the Bible. And you know, I know I've said this for some of you, but it bears speaking of again. This is a wonderful thing. It's one of the things that no atheist is able to really handle this. Or they can reject it, but they can't reject it with knowledge because if they e equip themselves with knowledge, they start to realize that their objections are meaningless. But the very first word of the Bible has Jesus in it. The very first word. This is 1,500 years before the cross. Now, I can go into the, the, into the uh, uh, 
uh, hieroglyphs and uh, the beginning of the language and all that and show you that Jesus is undeniably in the first word of the Bible and so is the cross which wasn't even invented for another thousand years. Not only that, the third, well, the second word of the Bible is Elohim and it is a plural. It's a plural singular. How can you have that? It's only when you can have a group going on here that the same as the as the uh, the man who walks into the locker room and he says all right team tonight today we're going to go out there as one right as one see that's a chad in the hebrew a plural one and elohim is a plural one it means that god is a family that's what it means folks right yes he's the one and only but he's also a family and then the, se- the third word is bara and bara is the word that means to create from nothing so it's it's b a r a in the in the english but in the hebrew it actually means god the son how about that so god the son is jesus and jesus is the creator of everything and you see that in the first chapter of uh, the book of John, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. And there it is, 1,500 years before the cross. It's right there in the third word of the Bible. Come on. Come on. Now, people can protest this stuff, but they can only protest it in their ignorance. When you start to look into it, you start to find out that this Word of God is of supernatural origin, that it has a divine author. I don't care how many pens were used, how many prophets there were, there's one author. Praise God. And we can see that over and over and over again. Jesus is in the beginning. He's in the very end. He's in the beginning of Revelation, first chapter, and in the end of Revelation. And all the way through it. Praise God. And he is what's called a meta-narrative of the whole Bible, the story within the story. It's Jesus all the way through. When you get to know this Jesus, you start to see him everywhere. He's all over the place. If you don't know him, you won't see him. You'll miss it. You'll just think, oh, this is a book of fables, a book of uh, morality, a book of history. Uh, uh, uh. No, it's the exposure of divine plan. That's what it is. His, his purpose, his beginning, his end, is everything right there. Understand, the reference to the beginning and the end is not only a statement in time, it also, and most importantly, is a statement of ontology. Ontology is a, is a word that means uh, pertaining to existence or beingness, beingness. Revelation 23.13 Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. In this statement, Jesus declares himself to be the plan of the Father and the finished work of the Father. He is the beginning and the end. He is the start and the finish. He is the the plan and its purpose and its fulfillment. He's everything. Philippians 2.13 assures us that through Jesus Christ, it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. What's that mean? Jim was talking about that before. He says, Christ in you. That's what it's all about, that God wants to be in you, and the only way God can be in you is Christ in you, right? And Jesus pointed to God the Father as his source when he said the unbelievers in John 10.32, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? So we can see that Jesus is God's desire, Jesus is God's effort, and Jesus is God's achievement. And I might add, the born-again believer is the ultimate achievement through Christ. And why is this? Because in Jesus dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's in Colossians 2 verse 9. 
In Jesus dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And in like manner, it is the desire of God the Father that he dwell, that God dwell in each one of us through Christ. This is the very thing that he began in eternity past, and he determined that it would be accomplished through Jesus and no other way, uniquely. Get rid of this idea that good works are your way to heaven. Not true. I don't care how good your works are. If they're not from him, they are of no value. Well, they may impress people, but they will not impress God. It's God working in us to will and to do for his good pleasure through Christ. And in like manner, it is the desire of God the Father that he dwell in each one of us. This is the very thing that he began in eternity past, and he determined that it would be accomplished through Jesus only. As we get to know Jesus, we receive more of the Father. In John 14, verses 23 to 24, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him. You know, there are two ways of looking at that. If anyone loves me, then he will keep my word. No. If anyone loves me, he will be able to keep my word because it's God working in us through Christ that keeps the word. Amen? My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my word. See, you can't keep his word if you don't love him. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. It's the Father's word. Christ only tells us what the Father says. Why? Because Christ is the Father in human flesh. New Age philosophers. I was in New Age for 20 years, folks. Oh, I reached guru level. All sorts of metaphysical flip-flops. Mediumship and all these uh, philosophical machineries that we have. Of course, it was mostly philosophy, but you know what? New Age philosophers teach that we are to be God. We are to become God. They got it backwards. The truth is, God is to become us. Right? We do not become God. God remains God, but he pours himself into willing vessels. Understand? The New Age philosophers have it backwards. God is becoming us through Christ. This is a profound mystery. What is it? Colossians 1.27 Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's no other. And what's glory? Glory is significance. Glory is uh, identity. Glory is substance. Glory is value. And it's only Christ in you that gives you substance, that gives you glory, that gives you value, that gives you significance. <laughs> you may impress people around you, but, you know, here today, gone tomorrow, right? And impressing people around you is fickle as can be. It can change on, a, on a, uh, in an instant. But impressing God, that's where it's at, is impressing God. So the New Age is a bit backwards. It might be said this way. In Jesus, the Word becomes flesh. So it is in Jesus that our flesh becomes the word. Huh? If this all sounds strange to you, listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 4.19. He says, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, until Christ be formed in you. Christ be formed in you. That's the purpose. That's what it's all about. That Christ be formed in you. This is what's called transformation, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed. And in 
Romans 8.22, it says, For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain until now. And what now is he talking about? We find the answer back up in Romans 8.19. It is for the earnest expectation of the creation endlessly, eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. And who are the sons of God? They are the ones that carry the Father's blood type. John 1, 12 to 13. This is such an important passage. But as many as received him, by your choice, right? He made the offer. I give you a treasure beyond measure. Will you take it? Until you reach out and take it, you don't have it. It's as simple as that. I've said it before. I could offer you a $100 bill right now. Until you come up and take it, you don't have it. But the offer is made universally. God offers it to everybody because he wants that not one be lost, but that all be saved. As many as received him, to them he gave the right, the privilege, the enablement to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, Jesus, who were born not of the normal physical blood, nor of the will of the flesh, of your human will, nor of the will of man, the opinion of humanity, unsaved humanity, but of God. They are the ones born of the Spirit of God into the kingdom of God. And what's the kingdom of God? Kingdom is the realm in which the king functions. The realm in which the king functions. If you're in the kingdom of God, you are an ambassador of God in that realm in which the king functions. And it's only by their fruit that they will be known. You see, Eve, who is in Genesis 3.20, she is the mother of all living. That's what it says. Eve comes first and is destined to die. What does she represent? She represents the physical person, the flesh. That's what Eve represents. And yes, she has to die. She's, she's the one that ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She's the one. It's our natural man, our physical, our lusts, our emotions, it's our carnal nature. That's Eve, right? And we see these symbols all through the Bible and what they, what they represent. And they can move around. Eve can represent other things too. But in this particular case, she is representative of the flesh, the physical person. But the scripture tells us in 1 Timothy 2.15 that she can be saved by death, from death by childbearing. Now, this is a big mystery to people. Mystery solved, folks. If you remember that Eve is a physical, per physical person, and then start to look at that statement that she will be saved by childbearing, in childbearing, if we continue in faith, love, and holiness, self-control. You know, childbirth doesn't save you. In fact, quite often it kills you. <laughs> Thank God, not very often today, but it sure used to, right? <laughs> was it Phyllis Diller said to a man who said what's it like having, having, bearing a child or giving birth to a child she said take your bottom lip stretch it up over the top of your head and you have some idea <laughs> you know there's some nasty things that we guys have to go through but I don't know uh, I'll trade them in for what a mother has to go through <laughs> Now look, there are three classic explanations of this mysterious verse. And check out your commentaries. This is a mysterious verse. One, woman plays her part in suffering the pain of childbirth and pertains to her duties as wife and mother as in an atonement for Eve's sin. You know, women are suffering all this because of Eve's sin. <laughs> But that would surely be meritorious favor, right? And would be unique to woman because men can't have children. 
And what about the barren woman who can't have children anyway? Is she sunk? Two, she maintains the morality expected of a wife and mother to be saved, but that would be adding something to Christ's cross for salvation, and nothing can be added to the cross, right? Or three, that as a Christian mother, she would not suffer death during childbirth. Now that is so ridiculous. But these are the three classical arguments for what this passage means. But they all fail to realize that the only way to salvation is through Christ. So the question remains, what kind of childbearing could possibly save anybody? What child is she bearing? Paul gives us the answer again in Galatians 4.19. My little children in whom I travail in birth until Christ be formed in you. Are you getting it? Are you seeing it? Now the Greek word translated childbirth also gives us a remarkable clue. It is technogonia, and it means to become a baby, to become a baby. But the word for baby, technon, it's right in that word, technogomia. It comes from roots that mean to pay a price, to vindicate, or to pay a penalty. It's also the same word used for carpenter. Jesus was a carpenter. And so we're talking about the travailing of a birth here. You see it? Jesus paved the way for us. He has handed us his glorious commission so that we may become partakers with him of his inheritance. The child which must be born for salvation is the new nature, the new creature. And the woman which must bear it is Eve, the natural man. The natural man. The new creature or the new nation nature emerges as the believer continues in faith, charity, and holiness with vigilance, as the word said, if they continue in these three things. And Hebrews 5, 9 finishes, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. I'll go a little further than that, to all who willingly follow him. So here's the conclusion of the matter. I call this message Alpha and Omega. And that's Greek. It might be more accurate to call it Aleph and Tav. That's Hebrew. But the interesting thing here is that they refer, both of them refer to the beginning and the end. And that's all you ever see. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. That's all you ever hear. But there's more to the story than that. Because Aleph Tav are two Hebrew letters that were originally two pictograms. And those pictograms were words. And those words were, Aleph was an ox head. The ox head was representative of the first or the most important or the leader and is representative of God the Father. <sighs> Tav is the second word beginning and the end. The beginning was God. The end was the Tav. The Tav is the cross, folks. It's the cross of Christ. The beginning and the end is God and then the fulfillment of everything that he, that he planned was at the cross. Uh, I've got to go a little further. It's the cross in each one of us. Because not only is Tav a cross, in the original pictogram, it was a cross. We're talking about 3,500 years ago, folks. Not only, and this is, you know, 1,500 years before there was such a thing as a cross that people were hung on. And I'm getting to that. It's also the signature at the end of a covenant in the Hebrew. Did you know that? When you write a covenant, a contract that's binding, a cross was put at the end of it. We, we have that sort of thing today in English, you know. Put your X here. Huh? 
or if you, if you can't read or write, put an X, right? You see how God has inc he's incorporated his truth in the most remarkable places, places you would never suspect, and it's there. So I'm telling you, that's why if, with an investigation, if you're serious about finding out whether this is true or not, if you're serious, you will come to the inevitable conclusion that it is exactly what it claims to be. And the only way you can think otherwise is not to check it out or to check it out in a superficial manner. So if it's true, it would be a good idea to follow it. If it's true, it would be a good idea to find out exactly what it says. If it's true, it would be a good idea to find out who this creator was who put me here and has a plan for me and what that plan might be and how to achieve that plan for his glory and for my glory too. Amen? But first of all, for his glory. The Aleph and the Tav. Another thing about the Aleph and the Tav, I'm getting rid of my notes at this point. Another thing about the Aleph and the Tav, it's the middle of the first verse of the Bible. The first verse of the Bible is Bereshit Elohim Barah. Then you have Aleph Tav. And then you have Mashiach Et. What you have now is six words with a seventh word, seventh symbol in the middle of the three and the three. Don't have it up there to show you. But the point is you have three words in the beginning, three words at the end in the very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the Hebrew, it's three words, three words at the end, and then in the middle, right in the middle. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Right in the middle. Now remember, created is uh, Beth Rosh. Uh, uh, Aleph. What that's saying is Christ. That's the Son of God, Christ, right there. That's what it's saying. It's the son of the house. The head of the house is the is son. Okay. Then in the very middle, middle you have Aleph, Tav, and the question marks there, see? Because nobody knows what that means. What that means is that God put himself on a cross to bring the heavens and the earth back to the beginning. That's what it means. You have God the Father is the, the one on the right. That's the, the, the X. Then you have the, like a little house there. Now go, go, go to the middle, in the middle. The, the house, you got, first of all, the first letter. Remember, they're going backwards, folks. They're not reading the same as we do. Then, so what you have is God and the cross. So God created the cross. God put himself on the cross as a fulfillment of his, co his contract to bring the creation, that's the earth and the heavens, back into the beginning with God. That right there is the gospel, folks, in the first verse of the Bible. And you see the same thing with John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. Who's the word? Jesus, the Aleph Tav. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God because the word was God. And it was nothing made. Barashit Elohim Barah. Nothing was made that was not made by him. He made something out of nothing. He made everything out of nothing. We can't do that. We have creative ability, but our creative ability is very limited. We can only fashion. We can't create. We can fashion from what has already been created. Right? What is it? Is it some, some little t story about the scientist who says to the theologian, or to, it says to God, <laughs> uh, you know, I can create too. Uh, and God says, well, uh, let, let me see you make a man. 
and uh, he's, he took some debt, and then God says, wait a minute, use your own debt. God created everything. All we can do is fashion from what he has created. Amen? Praise his holy name. Aleph and Tav is considered the unpronounceable name of God. It is in the very center of the statement of the beginning that the end was foretold. And an in-depth analysis of the first statement of Scripture in the original language reveals a creator who not only brought the universe into beginning or into being, but also entered into it to bring the beloved back into his household. It's there in the first verse. That's astounding, folks. That is absolutely astounding. Yeah, come on, come on. As it says in the song, <laughs> that song, I love that song. Who you say I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. Amen. I believe that it is telling us that the beginning and the end come together in God through Christ. In Jesus, we see God's desire, God's method, and God's success. So, we are encouraged in Hebrews 12, 2. To look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, in Jesus, all hope is realized. God's purpose and his satisfaction is found in Jesus. Jesus is both the cause and the effect. Jesus is the action and the reaction. He is the question and the answer. He is the puzzle and he is the solution. Jesus is sufficient for all things that pertain to godliness. He is the fulfillment of God's plan and salvation. Second Peter 1 verses 2 to 8. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. It blows me away. It, it always does. That this God in the Old Testament said, I will not share my glory with anybody. How could he? He hadn't come to earth as one of us yet. Now he says, I desire to share my glory with all of you. To be a partaker of his very nature, that he gives us the ability to do that, it's not in our ability, it's in his. Our willingness to accept him and to allow him to operate within us. He gives us that spirit, that mind, but then you've got to feed it. What are you going to feed it with? You are what you eat, folks. That's why it's so important. Don't just come and listen to me at this pulpit or anybody else for that matter. Come together for worship. Come together for maturity. Come together to... to to extend help to each other. Come together to care about each other. Yes, come together for all that, but devour this word. You, those of you who have not heard, not heard this before, there's too much of this ceremony and ritual. You know, you think that all you got to do is eat a wafer and drink a little bit of wine and you've, arrived, you've made it. That just is not the case. That is not the case. Here is the wafer right here. And the wine is his very blood. The wine is his life in you. That's what it is. The wafer and the wine are meaningless symbols if you don't understand what they represent. And when you know what they represent, you don't have to do them. You have to do what they represent. Otherwise, you're camped in a shadow and you're not paying any attention to where the, what is throwing the shadow. Read 
Ritual and ceremony have only one purpose, and that's discipline. But they will not feed you into transformation. Amen? I hope you understand what I'm saying here. I know I'm the Lone Ranger in this. Second Peter 2, uh, verses 2 to 8. It continues. But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1, verses 9 to 11. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgot, forgotten that he was, he was cleansed from all his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an, embrace, and, uh, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hmm. Don't be sin conscious. Be Christ conscious. I don't care what you've done in the past. If you've given yourself to the Lord Jesus, if you've done as I did so many years ago, stood in my living room and said, Lord Jesus, I don't know you, but I want to know you. And I give you uh, one year of my life. I will learn from nothing but you. Help me to unlearn everything else I've ever learned. All that new age garbage. Let it go down in the, flush it where, they, where it belongs. And I just want to hear what you have to say. And I read my Bible. And I listen to Bible tapes. And two months later, he showed up in my car with me. But you know what? He wouldn't have showed up if I had not taken the word into me. This, you know, you, if you don't eat, you'll starve. And if you don't feed that new spirit that you've asked for with the right nourishment, it will wither and die. Simple. But as you feed it with the right, what that which nourishes it, it will grow and grow, and it will make you conquer anything that comes your way. And all for the glory of God. All for the glory of God. I finish with this. Revelation 21, verse 6. And he said to me, it is done. When he takes up residence in you and me, it is accomplished. It is done. For why? I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the Olive and the Tav. The beginning and the end. The cause and the effect. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. Amen? Amen. What a glorious, glorious future God has for each one of us who will simply accept and follow him. You know, okay, be obedient to him, yes, fine. But I like to say, follow him. Follow him. I follow you, Lord, because I trust you. I follow you because I love you. I follow you because I have been given a spirit that enables me to see you as you truly are. Amen. Amen.